people, both chief priests and the scribes, came together, and they led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. By the way, in Jewish law, the accused was never required to testify against the In Jewish law, you always had to have two or three witnesses, which brought an accusation against the person. We don't even see that. They're asking Jesus to incriminate himself. Jesus said, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. What's Jesus saying there? These men have already determined in their minds that they want him dead. No matter what he says, no matter what happens, they're not going to let him go. Verse 69, Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you the Son of God? So he, just said, so he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? Except, don't they need further testimony out of the mouth of two or three witnesses? That's, that's Hebrew law. They said, we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And that was that. The decision was made. We've been studying the life of Jesus over the last several weeks, and we saw Judas recently betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. We saw Jesus with the 11 remaining disciples. They go to the garden, and they're praying, and Jesus is pleading with the Lord, if there's some other way, nevertheless, you will be done. And he asked those disciples to pray along with him, and, and he prayed for about an hour, and he goes back to them, and what are they doing? They're sleeping. So he says, wake up and pray. So he, he prays by himself about a stone's throw away and begins praying some more and he comes back again. They're sleeping again. But now all the praying is over because this massive uh, contingent from the Roman army, the, the Greek word is cohort. Uh, so that could be anywhere from maybe a small detachment of 100 or 200 people up to uh, the largest uh, size would be 600. This is basically what we call in today's uh, army a battalion. A battalion of soldiers has showed up in full battle rattle to arrest Jesus along with the temple police and many of the chief priests. 600 to 1,000 people have arrested Christ. Then we've read about how Peter followed at a distance and ends up in the yard of the high priest and he denies knowing Christ three times. Peter has ran away and he's weeping. And the high priest, verse 63, uh, has sent for others of the Sanhedrin. Uh, history tells us that there's 70 members of the Sanhedrin, some people say 72 members of the Sanhedrin, plus the high priest. So it's going to take some time to gather all of them together. And while they are waiting to arraign uh, Christ, verse 63, the temple police start beating him, start hitting him. There's this crowd of people, remember 600 to 1,000 people are there, they're still there, many of them, and they're treating Jesus horribly. Now there are a few things I want to say about this crowd, the crowd who arrested him, the crowd who is interrogating him. His entire ministry for the last three years has been nothing but crowds. Wherever he went, huge crowds. Even times he tried to get away and hide and he just needed a rest and a break. The crowds would follow him. They would find him. Now up until this point in the book of Luke and the history of the life of Christ, every crowd has been very positive 
towards him. Maybe a couple incidences. There was one incidence in his hometown, another instance where they wanted to uh, kill him. One time when they said that he's nuts, let's take him away to a hospital. But most of the crowds were very, very positive towards Jesus. But from his arrest in the garden to his death, there's going to be many, many more crowds. Everyone will be hostile from now on. From here on out, hostile crowds, vicious mobs who will do things to Jesus that they probably wouldn't normally do. Have you ever seen that in our world today? Where mobs of people get together and get riled up and do things, they, they commit crimes that they would never do as an individual. Some folks over the years, they've looked at verse 63 and they see these men beating Jesus, mocking him. Some people have questioned, how could they do that? How could they do those mean and terrible things to Jesus? How, how could they be so cruel? Well, a universal principle is when mobs get together, the energy gets going, and the large groups of people will do things that individuals would never do. Furthermore, uh, the crowd offers a little bit of Anonymity. That's another word I have trouble pronouncing. Did I say that right? Anonymity. And, and, and when you're in this huge mob, you can't pick people out of the crowd. Uh, nowadays, they do a little bit better because they have so much video surveillance footage and, and facial recognition. But back then, right, you could just, everyone gets away with it. You've seen that happen on the news. People gather and they riot and they burn down buildings in protest. They loot and steal sneakers and TVs. That's a mob mentality. And that's likely part of what is going on here in this instance is this mob has got together and they're just treating Jesus in a terribly cruel way. You see, Jesus hadn't even committed a crime. Now, if you look at some of the other Gospels, uh, they did bring forward some witnesses. They kept bringing forth witnesses, but they were all liars. They were false witnesses, and they couldn't get their story straight until finally they did get two guys that said, well, Jesus said that he would tear down the temple. Well, that's not exactly what he said when you look back. He said that he would die and be raised up in three days. But that's, that, that testimony is even besides the point because in Jewish law, you, you couldn't be punished for something you said you were going to do. You had to actually do it. Uh, he didn't tear apart the temple, so how, how could you get in trouble for that? So Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. They couldn't prove it. They didn't have witnesses. And the only real crime he committed was offending the leadership of Israel. He offended them. Even when he was arrested in the garden, he wasn't told why. This entire charade was complete injustice. Some of the, the books list them all these injustices and they show uh, back, they connect it to the ancient Jewish law and if, if you want to get bored, you can read that. You could go book after book after book. One guy said they could spend the next three months looking at all the injustices that was done to Christ. Every step the Sanhedrin took was illegal. Listen to this one. According to Jewish law, they weren't supposed to arrest people in secret at night. They weren't supposed to conduct trials at night. Trials were supposed to be done during the day in public. If someone was going to be charged with a crime requiring the death penalty, the Sanhedrin had to deliberate for three days. And during those three days, they had to fast. 
because it was such a serious thing to have to put somebody to death. In, in Jesus' case, they didn't deliberate for three days, maybe three hours. When we sort of try to break the entire night and that, that morning into hours, Jesus' trial and questioning at most was three hours. Mark 14, 64 says, when they finally decided to make a decision, it says they all condemned him to death. Uh, the implication, <clears throat> the verse could also be translated, everyone who was there voted to condemn Jesus. The implication is perhaps maybe not all the Sanhedrin was present. They only woke up the ones who had towed the, the line of the high priest. Perhaps all the Sanhedrin was there. There's another verse indication in Matthew 14, I believe, that says they were all there, but those who protested killing Jesus, those who questioned the legality of the trial being done at night, they were threatened and, and removed or not allowed to vote. Later on in the Gospels, we read about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus taking down the body of Jesus from the cross washing him, preparing him for burial. There is significant evidence from Scripture and, the, and from history that both of those men were on the Sanhedrin. They wouldn't have voted to condemn Jesus. So this means either they weren't there or they weren't allowed to vote. Because Mark 14, 64 says they all voted to condemn Jesus to death. Which brings us to another very interesting Jewish law that said if the entire court, no matter if it was the local court of 23 elders in your village or the high Jewish court of about 70 in the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, uh, if everyone voted the accused guilty, they would have to be set free because there was an obvious setup or a lack of mercy on their part. But, Kind of interesting. Time after time, everything about this trial is proving to be a sham. It's completely illegal. Everything that was going on was false. Luke doesn't tell us this, but after the high priest declared Jesus guilty, he ripped his robe. He tore his garments. And I think it's Matthew that tells us that. This was actually forbidden in, in Mosaic law as well. I mean, the list of details pointing this to this travesty of justice. Have you ever been to an arraignment? An arraignment? I have. Not my own but I've been to one before. Uh, my mom was a magistrate in Tuscola County for a while, and I went to work with her a few times. And after a suspect was arrested and booked by the police, they were taken to the judge or the magistrate for a formal arraignment. Now this is kind of what is going on with Jesus right now. That's the closest thing in our court system. Uh, to compare it to as an arraignment. Now at the arraignment, if I recall correctly, the suspect is told the reason while they are there and they are read their formal charges. Now during the arraignment, the suspect is never asked to confess. Uh, there is no questioning per se. It is just reading them their formal charges. Yet this is what the priests seem to be doing with Jesus. They're questioning him. They're trying to get him to confess. If you are the Christ, tell us, are you the son of God? Now, I appreciate our Savior because if you or I would have been there, we would have said, are we going to wait till the daylight? Are you, can I get a lawyer here? Where are the, fault? Where are the witnesses? Now, Jesus is quiet, he is calm, he is cool, he is collected during this entire debacle. 
I think that brings us to our first point of application this morning. I think the way Jesus acted in, in spite of this incredible injustice is an example for us. Uh, John 14, 27, that Lyle read earlier, says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, when Jesus was talking about peace, he didn't just talk about peace. Jesus didn't just say, I command you to have peace during difficult situations. He had peace in this incredible trial. He modeled peace during this entire uh, travesty of justice. And Jesus told us there in John 14 that he wants to give us his peace. You know, that's the reason we can have peace during difficult times. It's because Jesus had peace. And he promises to give us his peace. He had peace during a legal trial at night with false witnesses making these crazy accusations. He's been hit in the face but who knows how many times. And yet the entire time, he is calm. I highly doubt any of us in here have experienced anything close to this level of injustice or wrongdoing. Yet Jesus is at peace. Yeah, you know, I've met some people that fly off the handle or lose their cool just from stubbing their toe. They start going off with some crazy thing. When Jesus was beaten, he didn't say a word. Some people go crazy just from a look or a word that somebody says. While Jesus, this entire time, through all of it, he remains calm, and that's, that's peace, my, my friends. And I think this is important for us in this day and age when there's a seemingly constant push to instigate. You notice that? You just, everywhere you turn, there's somebody trying to instigate you. They're, they're questioning you. There's this push to divide constantly. And there's much temptation on individuals to become critical or get frustrated. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you my peace. And it's not peace like the world gives, which is really a false peace until they decide to start fighting again. And the more I looked at this, the, the more I thought is maybe there's somebody watching, maybe there's somebody out here that needs this peace that Jesus offers. Relax, calm down. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. John 14, 27. And as a pastor, it's easy for me to get up here and say these things, right? But I know it's possible. I know it can be done because Jesus was able to have peace during an unjust nighttime trial. And he said, I'm going to give you that peace. I'm going to give you that peace. Now I want you to see this. It's, it's worth mentioning this morning. Uh, did you know that whenever Jesus is asked question, uh, he's asked questions by the Sanhedrin, did you notice that he chooses his words very carefully? Now when you read Luke and Matthew and, and Mark and John and get the complete picture, there was multiple trials that he ended up having, uh, multiple times in front of the Sanhedrin, that he went in front of Pilate, and, and then he went in front of uh, Herod, and then I think he went back to Pilate before he was finally uh, decided to put to death. But whenever Jesus is, is in front of somebody, he always chooses his words very carefully. And they can't hardly get any, any, any incriminating evidence because Jesus is so calm. He's at peace. And his words just, 
he never really flies off the handle like probably what you and I would. He's just so level-headed. How many here know that choosing your words carefully is important? <laughs> Willie raised his hand high. <laughs> Have you ever stuck your foot in your mouth, Willie? Long ways. Long ways. I remember one time years ago at church, I saw this happen. Uh, I saw it happen. I heard it. There was a, a young couple that was the first time visitor at our church, and, and another couple went up to them, and they, they started talking to them, and they found out that they one was a teacher and one was an athletic trainer at the school. And this other couple says, Oh, you should teach our youth group. You should teach our youth group. I, <clears throat> just because they were young people and worked at the school. Well, if I went into a church and somebody did that to me, I'd be like, scared and probably leave. I remember another instance. A couple had been visit, visiting our church, maybe. They were there about once or twice a month, and they'd been there for about a year, and uh, they had darker skin, and, and I had talked with them, and I had learned that they were from uh, Middle Eastern descent. One particular Sunday, we were having a a Mexican themed dinner with tacos and stuff after the service. And a lady walked right up to that couple and said, come to our Mexican dinner, even though it's probably not as good as what you're used to. What was she talking about? They weren't Mexican. That couple never did come back to church again. I think Jesus not only gives us a great example about peace, but I think he gives us a great example about choosing our words carefully. You know, the things we say can affect people. Not just visitors, it can affect each other. So we have to be at peace, and we have to choose our words carefully. Verse 66, we're almost done. Clock says we have like 15 minutes left. Yeah. Verse 66. I think this is very relevant to us. Sometimes you talk to uh, people in their 20s and they're like, God, ah, the scriptures aren't very relevant. I, I think this is really relevant to our particular situation in that we live in. It says the elders, scribes, and chief priests came together. Now, please remember that these are religious people. These are highly religious people who know their Bible backwards and forwards. You know, they could quote some obscure passage from Psalms, and they knew Isaiah. They knew, you know, 2 Kings 12, 18, you know, that we have no clue what that is. They knew the Word of God very well. And I think this verse in particular, out of all the verses that we've mentioned this morning, should give us pause. Because these people that are beating Jesus, these people that are accusing Jesus, wanting to kill Jesus, they're not evil heathens, like these Romans that believe in weird false gods. They're not idol worshipers that are putting on Jesus uh, on trial, that are corrupt to the core. Who is it? It's the Bible believers. Folks, just kind of thinking out loud, what are we? we we're, we're the Bible believers. So I think when we read this story of the life of Jesus, we have to be aware of potential shortcomings when a person decides to ignore the scriptures in order to do what they've already decided they're going to do. I mean, they decided they're going to condemn Jesus. They're, they're going to kill Jesus no matter what. They've thrown out all the Hebrew laws. They've thrown, they've thrown out all the Bible, all the Old Testament that talks about mercy and grace time and time again because they're going to do what they want to do no matter what. 
the Bible believers. They throw out the Bible. Like I say, I don't have any particular examples about that for us. I just think that makes us think. Could I go down that path? Could it maybe start with a mob mentality and descend into saying mean things and wrong things because there's no peace and, and, and I'm not thinking calm and collected and I just fly off the handle and, and I'm going to throw out scriptures because this is what I want to do. So think about this and, and we're going to continue studying this uh, mock trial of Jesus because uh, he goes before Pilate as we look in Luke 23 next week. Let's pray. Father God, there's many different people that we keep hearing about in the story. We've read about Judas just betrayed Christ. There was no real relationship there. We, we've heard about Peter who loved Christ but made a, a terrible mistake and sinned in denying Jesus. Lord, we read about these ultra-religious, elite Bible believers who aren't really, don't have any genuine faith. They're doing what they want no matter what. And then, of course, we see your son Christ the perfect example. Someone, hopefully, that we're striving to be like. Father God, I, I don't know uh, my friends, my family, which person they're kind of relating to. Whether it's they relate to Judas and they need salvation. Whether they're relating to Peter and they need forgiveness and restoration. Whether they're relating to who knows Father God, regardless of who we relate to, help us to look to your son Jesus as that perfect example of peace. Lord, maybe there's someone that's uh, out there struggling with stress, anxiety, fear, a depression, or worry of some kind. And they need your peace, Lord. Lord, I, I just pray that uh, these familiar passages of Scripture, that as we dig into them and, and learn about them, that uh, they wouldn't become commonplace or, or routine, that they truly would be relevant to our everyday lives. In Jesus' name we pray. You would stand and sing whatever our closing song is. Number 253. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
you for coming. We'll see you later.